start over. Hi, uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Jeff Tenenbaum, chair of the nonprofit organizations practice at the Venable Law Firm. Welcome to our uh, program today, uh, uh, sponsored by the Greater Washington Society of CPAs, entitled Sales and Use Tax for Nonprofits, Updates and Expectations for 2013. <clears throat> My colleagues and I are very pleased and, and honored to be able to uh, present to you as part of the monthly uh, uh, breakfast meeting series that the Greater Washington Society of CPAs has been doing uh, for many years. Uh, I've had the good fortune of being able to participate in a number of these uh, breakfast meetings and programs. Uh, over the years, uh, and many of my colleagues and I have participated in your December not-for-profit symposium a number of times. Um, always very fond of this organization. It's a terrific group. Made a lot of good friends and colleagues uh, through the organization, and uh, we're always pleased to uh, have the opportunity to speak with you um, today. As, as you heard, this program is being uh, recorded. Uh, we don't have any webinar participants, but GWS CPA was kind enough to allow us to record the presentation as we post uh, all of the recordings of uh, monthly webinars and some other programs that we do uh, on our website. Uh, so if you have any colleagues or others who might be interested in listening to this program after the fact, uh, you can find the uh, recording. It should be posted by tomorrow on our website at the following link, www.venable.com slash nonprofit slash recordings. Venable.com slash nonprofit slash recordings. The topic that my colleagues and I are going to be talking to you about today uh, is a topic that may not always seem like the sexiest, most exciting topic in the world, uh, but it's actually a topic, as, as many of you probably well know, uh, that's a very important one. Uh, it's a topic that comes up quite a bit, uh, it's come up quite a bit in all the years that I've been practicing law and representing nonprofits. Uh, and most particularly, it's an area that, has, that seems to cause a lot of confusion, where there's a lot of misunderstanding, a lot of misperceptions, uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of ways and areas where you can easily get tripped up, um, and also a lot of opportunities, frankly, that a lot of nonprofit organizations fail to take advantage of. Um, now, today's program is going to cover uh, some of the basics in this area because we need to be sure that everyone's on the same page and has the same basic grounding. Um, so once we cover the basics, though, the real focus of today's program is going to be on 2013 and, and what's new and different and how is the landscape changing. And there are a lot of changes in the works, perhaps more now than in, uh, in this area, in the sales and use tax area, than at any time in, in recent past. Uh, so it is a very timely program, and I think you'll really enjoy it here today. Uh, my colleagues, uh, Walter Calvert and Tamara Langlieb, um, uh, came down today from our Baltimore office. Uh, I've worked with Walter for many years, probably almost my whole, maybe my whole time at Venable uh, for about uh, 14 years. Um, and uh, uh, Tamara is a little bit newer to the practice. Uh, they're both uh, terrific lawyers, uh, uh, specializing in the tax area. Uh, and and uh, I have the have had the good fortune to, to to work with both of them on sales and use tax issues. They've worked with uh, dozens and dozens of our nonprofit clients. Uh, over the years in counseling them and helping through issues and problems in this area. They're, they're terrific, uh, terrific attorneys. Uh, Walter also uh, works with us a lot in the taxes and bond financing area, which is another area of his specialty. Um, and I, I know that at least some, one person in the audience uh, has had the good fortune of working quite a bit in transactional work uh, with Walter in that area. Um, I can't recall if their bios, actually they're not, I was going to say their full bios are, are in your handout materials, but they're not, uh, but that's okay. Uh, you can uh, read more about uh, their backgrounds if you're interested on, uh, on our firm's website. I'm not going to take the time to go through those here today. I uh, just want to uh, let you know that you're in for a, a pretty interesting, uh, informative program. One thing we do want to encourage you to do is to ask questions throughout. Um, with the size of the group here, I think we can accommodate that. Uh, bear with me as I will be briefly repeating your questions for purposes of the, uh, of the recording uh, before our speakers answer those questions, but no need to save your questions to the end. Uh, ask your questions throughout, and we'll try to make this as interesting and interactive and informative as we can. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Walter to get us started. Walter. Good morning. We're going to try to move you fairly quickly this morning through five different major topic areas which run into each other and interface with each other, um, all in the context of sales and use tax with the focus on nonprofits' involvement. Um, nonprofits when they sell things, nonprofits when they buy things. Pretty quickly when you talk about selling things, we're going to end up looping into the third topic, nexus, which is probably the main theme and word we'll deal with this morning, nexus. Um, we'll go on a little to sales and use tax audits, mainly focusing there just on the nexus questionnaire topic. And lastly, to the extent we have time allowing, 
jump off under a little bit of a tangent, which is conferences, which we find nonprofits increasingly getting caught up in the taxation that occurs either as a consequence of hosting or a consequence of attending conferences across the United States. Um, to the extent this may or may not be an exciting topic, I know aside from whatever professional interest you have here today, it also tends to be a very personal topic for all of us. Um, I'm not an economist, but I know that I, and I think collectively, we probably all exhibit in our own personal behavior really why we're here today, which is that if we sit at home and we need to buy the next gift or the next widget or whatever it is, we all tend to be most inclined, given equal opportunities of going down the road and buying it at Sears and paying our local sales and use tax, or going to Amazon and knowing right away we're saving our 5 6 7 or 8% sales tax, we're going to be most inclined to go to Amazon and order it and know we've dodged that little bullet of the tag on the sales tax. And again, our collective behavior has driven Amazon and the other Internet vendors to just become the dominant mover in this area as states realize they are losing revenue more and more each year that they've been able to capture in the past because of the rules we'll talk about. And we'll end up today, to the extent of the nexus topic, of what is happening right now in Congress at the federal level to change everything and perhaps change our ability to personally dodge sales and use tax. Um, jumping into the theme topic of when nonprofits sell goods and just the basic rules you're going to encounter at the state level, virtually everything we're going to talk about other than the nexus topic is highly localized in terms of We've got roughly 45 states now that have sales and use tax laws, and while there's some uniformity, there's also an awful lot of difference. So that if you're a nonprofit who has gotten into any activity that has you selling things, be it your instructional videos, be it that you're a museum with a gift shop, uh, be it that you're a college with a bookstore, um, any of those activities raise the question of when you sell goods, are you able to avoid paying sales and use tax? And the general answer across the country is no. There's no generalized exemption that favors exempt organizations selling. And I mean, I think we're all familiar with the generally exempt organizations by their nature get the benefit of federal income tax exemption, and usually piggybacking on that is state income tax exemption. And now we're going to the totally separate question of in the sales and use tax world, what, if any, benefit do exempt organizations get by reason of their status as such? And the first answer is, well, really not much on the selling side. You will find various little local exemptions that deal with uh, gift shops in hospitals or certain fundraising events. Um, more often than not, if someone asks you, I will find there isn't an answer. They'll ask, well, why when my local private school held the pizza fundraiser or held the silent auction, why wasn't I charged sales and use tax? And the answer often will be, well, there's not really a reason. Everybody just looked the other way and the states tend not to chase those little events. Um, many states do have what's called a casual or isolated sale, which does permit you to kind of on a one-time basis do a transaction, but that has nothing unique to nonprofits to it. It is a reason why one transaction or a couple transactions may dodge sales and use tax. So that's sort of the, the simple side of selling. You then move to the complex side of selling, which is, okay, you're selling goods, Presumably, when you first started to do business in a state, you had to register with that state to get incorporated. And virtually always when you do that, the states will ask you to sign up for everything in the way of taxation, which will usually mean signing up to be a sales and use tax vendor, putting you on the state's list of parties that are going to collect sales and use tax and turn it over. That becomes just a fairly routine process when you're selling right out of your bookstore or your gift shop. But where it right away gets complicated is when you start selling outside the state. And with the Internet, that has obviously opened the door for not just the Amazons of the world, but the small vendors of the world to get a website and begin selling outside their state. And the question then turns to, okay, when do I have an obligation? And this is our single big question for the day, is as a vendor, when do you have an obligation to collect sales and use tax and turn it over to your state or to a state um, when you've sold someplace other than that place that's your home place of business. And the single big theme we'll repeat several times during the course is physical presence. So if you're selling goods over the Internet, the question will be, do you have physical presence in 
the particular jurisdiction to which you're selling. If so, you probably have the obligation to collect sales and use tax there. So let's hold that because that's heading off into the nexus theme, which gets pretty deep pretty fast. And let's turn to the sort of second theme, which is, I'm sorry, I'm not moving the slides along here. Jump ahead to, again, if you get questions along the way, please shout them out and Jeff can make sure we all get them down. Um, sliding ahead to when you're buying goods, and often there would, will be more favorable exemptions for exempt, organi exempt organizations when they buy goods. Um, I guess as a fundamental question is you get which organizations get the benefit of this status. Um, in many jurisdictions, they'll give it to C3 organizations that you can register and get a number or a certificate that entitles you to buy goods and avoid paying sales and use tax when you buy them. Again, this is going to vary a lot by states. In D.C., for example, it tends only to be C3s. In Virginia, you get 501C3s and 501C4s. C4 is being a category called social welfare organizations. Over in Maryland, the two categories are C3s plus C17s, which are certain veterans organizations. And so once you get beyond the general theme, which is 501C3 nonprofits can generally buy goods without having to pay local sales and use tax, provided they register with the state and get either a number or a certificate, whatever the state requires you have, to demonstrate that you are entitled to buy them good for that tax. Um, now sliding back to this topic of nexus, let me go down what nexus really is. Uh, the simplest word I use alternatively is connection. And this all comes out of federal law, the U.S. Constitution, and cases which go back to 1967 <coughs> and the early 90s. And the two names you'll constantly hear are Bellis Hess, which was the first case, and Quill, which was the second case. And that's where our U.S. Supreme Court, highest law of the land, came down with this principle that in order for a state to be order able to compel a vendor to collect its tax, you had to have physical presence in the state. And this is different than what many of you who work in the income tax world are going to be used to, where there's more of a vague economic nexus or some lesser theme that once you've begun to have some activity selling product or doing business in a state, you then become liable to pay income tax to the state. Sales tax has retained this bright wall of, as a vendor, your obligation to collect sales and use tax is only going to arise if you have physical presence, typically meaning an office there, employees there, repeated contacts with the state. And this is the world of Amazon. Amazon has tried as hard as it could to stay out of as many states as it could in terms of being physically present there to maintain its ability to take the position that it doesn't have the obligation to collect sales and use tax. But the mayor, I should probably turn to you to talk a little about use tax because it's sort of the mystery prong that runs this whole thing. Um, let me go down one quick tangent and then I'll go there. And that's, as a vendor, Again, you sell goods in your home state, you're obligated to collect goods, to collect sales tax when the product is delivered in the state. One question I actually very seldom hear get answered or asked even is, well, what if I'm selling the goods from here in D.C., sending it off to somebody in Maryland, I don't have any connection in Maryland, I don't have to collect Maryland tax, what about D.C. tax? Don't I have to do it because I took the order here in Maryland and I filled the order here, I'm sorry, took the order here in D.C., accepted it here in D.C., and then fulfilled it by sending goods and services out. And that's just sort of one of the little gaps in sales and use taxes. Long ago, the states took the position that they wanted to sort of encourage their home state vendors to be selling goods across the whole country and have just collectively not taken the position that you have to collect sales tax on transactions where the goods are going somewhere else. So that's the piece you'll sell them here talked about, but it's just a little niche in the, in the whole process to understand. Mayor, why don't you turn to the use tax side of the discussion, of course. <clears throat> so, so use tax is just the flip side of sales tax. It's kind of getting rid of the middleman. So as Walter was talking about sales tax, when you go to a brick and mortar store 
you buy the shoes that you want, you, the vendor will collect sales tax on it, and then on your behalf, that vendor will submit it to the, to the state. Use tax is when you order from Zappos, and there is no sales tax, there's no tax put on it. You yourself are supposed to be remitting the use tax, which would be the same amount as the sales tax to the state. As you can imagine, um, and I don't want to ask how many people actually do um, file this because I'm sure everyone's hand would go up. Um, absolutely, it, it's not followed. Um, and so the states are often wondering how can we get um, people to either do the use tax, and they have becoming a little bit more aggressive of it. But it's funny, when I was looking about the use tax, there is one state where I was shocked 10% of the residents actually submit the use tax. And no, it's not D.C. or Baltimore, it's Maine. So I think that is a very honest state, and um, they, all, they all do it, which is incredible. But on the whole, it isn't followed, and that's been the difficulty that the states have been having. Um, let's see a couple other things on use tax. Um, a number of the states have tried over the years, and a number still do. I think maybe actually 25 was the number I last saw put on the bottom of their income tax return a place for you to add on use tax. And I think at one point Virginia may have done that and backed off it. Pennsylvania now does have it. It's always been a dicey topic with the states because they, 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 when you put it on the income tax return, it means down at the bottom when you sign, you're signing under penalties of perjury. And they want that standard to remain a true strong standard for income tax. And in many states, there's a reluctance to kind of know that people aren't real compliant on use tax and don't want to get them caught up in signing something under penalties of perjury when on the use tax side, they may not really be fully complying on the way they would on the income tax side. So the use tax has been a battle for the states. And as Tamara was saying, the real question is how do you get your vendors obligated to collect use tax, which is a major, I guess I should note, our own four firm, Venable, many years ago got caught on use tax as, for me, it's been probably when you do see sales and use tax audits, probably the most common thing I've ever seen is use tax in the business context. They will mail order their computer from Dell or whomever. It'll come in and Dell has no, you know, place of business in your, where you're working, so there's no sales tax on it. Two years later, the auditors come in to do a general sales and use tax audit and one of the easiest things they find is reviewing the invoices of what your business bought over the past several years, as long as the statute of limitations is open, and they see that you bought a computer from, you know, somewhere in the Midwest, and well, where's the use tax you paid to D.C. on that? And the answer virtually is always no, and there's virtually n always no way to get out of that. What you really end up negotiating is trying to keep the penalties and interest on the tax on use tax at a minimum. Um, so states have a pretty good track record of being able to audit businesses and capture use tax over time. Um, just another side story on use tax, again, because it is the driving theme on why we're talking about this whole topic. Maryland, for a number of years, was getting frustrated with people going to North Carolina and buying furniture. And it's probably in, five, in the five to ten year time frame back, they literally started stopping trucks the enforcement officers the comptroller has, usually to police things like tobacco and alcohol contraband, literally stopped the furniture trucks that were coming into Maryland, would look at the invoices to see where the furniture was being delivered in the state of Maryland, and then sending letters to the homeowners located at the addresses on those invoices saying, we have indications that you have bought furniture from another state. Please either indicate to us that you paid sales tax to North Carolina when you bought the furniture, and if not, please remit tax on the $10,000 of furniture we see that you bought and are now using in the state of Maryland. And that really, that went to court in, the, in Maryland. It went to court in the question of whether the North Carolina furniture vendor, one of them, should have been collecting tax in Maryland, and that got very complicated and eventually didn't get anywhere that's of significance for our discussion today. But that's, again, the lengths the states will go to in order to try to collect use tax and why we have the battle going on today. Um, we now move really into the theme of nexus, which sort of done a quick overview on, which is do you have physical presence in the state? 
And you can imagine with 45 different states, each trying to deal with a single constitutional rule, which at the beginning is very simple, physical presence, but quickly has resulted in litigation spanning several decades now of what physical presence is enough physical presence, and with the Supreme Court not having spoken since 1992 or three on the topic, I'm now up to 20 years waiting more guidance on it other than uh, different cases across the states. Um, it's fair, maybe in a second you can talk about the Scholastic book case. Um, in general, what you see is questions of, okay, we don't have an office in the state, we don't have employees in the state, but what about lesser contacts in the state? What about when you hire a third party, uh, an agent or a representative who's going to go regularly into the state for you and market your goods or products? Or it may be in the context of nonprofits that in Chicago every year there's the big trade association that goes on for the week, and you send out your, some of your staff members out there for a seven-day week-long conference in Chicago in the state of Illinois well, does that seven days of having one of your employees in the state of Chicago give you enough connection with that state that now when somebody mail orders your local video from your D.C. office, that you're now obligated to collect sales and use tax on that sale in the Chicago, uh, Illinois? Um, maybe you want to chat about Scholastic, which is one of the current cases, more recent cases. This is one of my uh, favorite cases because I think it exemplifies sales tax. And I think, just so you, as a background, I was um, brought up by scientists and accountants. So I was always told one plus one equals two. So walking into the area of sales tax is totally my rebellious side because there is no one plus one is two in sales tax. Scholastic is the same facts. We, everybody remembers that your kids go to school, they come home with those order forms, they order it, bring it back to school, and the teacher submits it, and the teacher gets some sort of folk discount. They can get free books for the poor, they can get free books for the classroom, something like that, um, and that's what they get in return. And so what has happened is some states have looked at this and said those teachers are now considered representatives of Scholastic. So therefore, Scholastic has the tax speak nexus or a presence in that state. The teachers had no contract. They don't get paid in remuneration, but they said that they had some sort of presence and they whopped Scholastic with millions of dollars of sales tax and penalties. So what I love about it is this went to five or six different states have looked at it. Three said, yes, they have nexus. Three said, no, you don't have nexus. And so it's incredible. That, that to me is, is that rebellious? That is so not one plus one equals two. Same facts, same issue, and completely different results. Connecticut whopped them with a $3.3 million uh, penalty. And so it was interesting. It's not Amazon that was trying to go to the Supreme Court to figure out. It was Scholastic. And so they did apply for cert to find out whether there should be some sort of standard, whether these teachers are creating nexus for Scholastic. But um, the Supreme Court denied it. So as of yet, it is still um, up in the air, and you just have to be careful which state. And Scholastic in, exhibits what's really a challenge in giving advice in this area. Um, and if we get asked, you know, as an example, we have teachers in a state that helps get our product sold in that state. And does that mean we have nexus across the country by using that method? It's hard to give a single answer of yes or no. It's, well, in Tennessee, yes, because there's a case that says that. In state Y, well, no, because the court there said no. In state Z, well, there's no decision there, so it could be either way at this point. It's a pretty aggressive state, so you probably better be careful, or it's one of the less aggressive states, so you can probably be a little more lenient there and not jump on it until they actually come after you. But it's difficult to give, you know, across the country answers when you get into this topic of nexus. Um, at this point in time. Um, I mean, what we've seen the states do is make a gradual progression of how they try to get an out-of-state vendor tagged with physical presence. And the first level is this sort of, do you have a representative of some sort, the scholastic case? Anybody who's in the state acting as your agent, representative, employee at the one extreme. Across the spectrum, they've gone to lesser connections um, 
that include affiliates. And this actually grew out of the early stages of, of selling with the bookstores is one of the good examples. But what the bookstores did was say, yes, we have bricks and mortar stores in your state, Barnes and Noble, Borders. What we're going to do is very simple. Our simple, clever approach to it will be we will set up affiliate corporation number two, Barnes and Noble Online, separate legal entity, solely owned, you know, under common control, and it will be the Internet vendor. That legal corporate entity, barnesandnoble.com, will have no presence in any state but State Z, Wyoming, has no sales tax, great place to stick these Amazon type companies. Um, it will be the bookseller of record for anything that you're buying over the internet. And so we're not going to collect sales and use tax because it has no physical presence anyplace. And the states rapidly began to challenge that. And, and the decisions weren't uniform, but the trend over, it took several years for this to make it through the court. The trend began to become the court saying that, well, it's fine if there's absolute separation, but seldom was there absolute separation. There was virtually always some intermingling of the marketing or distribution process, such that if you bought the book online, you could take it back to the bricks and mortar store and it would make it back to the Amazon.com side of things. Or you might get coupons in the bookstore that you could then use online, or you may only have one card that is your card that works across either of them as your magic number to collect points. And the courts argued that, or the states argued that those type of affiliations meant you really had just one common business. And as I say, the trend began to be that in most states where it was litigated, the states would win and the obligation would fall on borders.com or barnesandnoble.com to have to collect sales and use tax. And it became one of the purest, like Amazon, where they had no bricks and mortar stores, didn't have the affiliation type networks with a local physical entity that have continued to be able to dodge it. Um, that's the affiliate nexus concept. And the one that, and again, Amazon's the driver here, and that's why the next one. Is uh, Tennessee a state that doesn't have uh, state regulation on sales or use tax? Because I, I just recently came through uh, the Nashville area, and I came across a huge uh, warehouse. <coughs> The, the question uh, is, is whether, uh, what's Tennessee's regulation of sales and use tax, and is there uh, a reason why uh, Amazon uh, has chosen to put a big facility there? Um, this uh, picture that's on the screen now is, I'm not sure, if, Tamara, if you're able to read it and decipher it quickly, please do so as we're looking at it. But it is from an article the Wall Street Journal did uh, a few months back showing exactly what Amazon in particular was doing across the country and the positions it was trying to take in different states. And my recollection, go ahead. I think Tennessee, according to this, is a safe state. It, they've also had issues with the Scholastic um, coming back. And unlike um, other cases where they were saying you're a representative, the teachers are representative there, they said, well, you used our schools our schools have a physical presence there. So I think it's kind of neutral. They're not going as far to say the extreme argument, which like Connecticut and um, California are saying, you know, even in the scholastic is, we're going to just say they're representative. They're, they're looking at it that way. And um, according to this chart, it's more, it's more neutral. It's not, it's neither very aggressive nor very conservative. I mean, what you can tell from this is the bold border around Tennessee is acknowledging that Amazon has a physical presence there. And I don't remember for sure. There are a number of states where Amazon has actually negotiated arrangements whereby in exchange for putting our major distribution facility in your state, you will provide us some interim favorable status. And in some cases, it's been just a phase in of the sales and use tax. And again, I don't remember for sure what Tennessee's situation is. Well, it, it looks like the states that have that blue border around it are states where Amazon has located a, uh, what is it, a, a warehouse, technology development office, or a, or a call center, uh, and that's certainly one of those states. And, and, and if you notice, 
I'm a frequent user of Amazon myself. I think I may be one of their best customers, actually. Um, and uh, thankfully, uh, they seem to have no uh, none of their facilities here in D.C. where I live because uh, every, every time I order something, um, there is no sales tax assessed. Um, uh, when I order something to be delivered here, but recently I ordered something to be delivered in Pennsylvania, and boom, the sales tax pops up. Uh, and that's obviously because, as you can see, they do have a, uh, a facility there um, in Pennsylvania. And I'll just decide that Jeff makes me think of when he mentions people buying things in different states for delivery. There was in New York, there was one of the major CEOs there who got caught where he tried to play the game of, yes, I live in New York, yes, I reside in New York, yes, I'm going to order a product in New York from a New York, in this case it was art gallery, but I'm going to tell them to deliver it to my home out in Connecticut, and then I'm going to actually have it delivered here to me in New York. And he got caught for millions of dollars of liability by, he was a very wealthy gentleman, for trying to dodge New York sales and use tax by reason of trying to take delivery of product in a different jurisdiction where it was actually clear on the facts that he was buying it in a state and in the end taking possession and use of it in that state. So. The states are sensitive to the idea of, well, maybe you'll have it shipped off to Delaware where there's no sales and use tax, and then bring it back to your Maryland residence. Um, Just to add one point to that, I think what's also important to remember this is like all taxes, the interest and penalties are really what get you. And, and as an organization trying to figure out whether to collect the tax or not to collect the tax, that's, you know, we, we will often say that it's not only the tax that's at issue, it is also the penalties and interest um, that will, will ramp it up tremendously. Now, an aside into constitutional law. I'm afraid we must go there for a moment, but constitutional law it is. Um, the U.S. Commerce Clause is what drives a lot of this, and the U.S. Commerce Clause generally gives Congress if you want to be better. Um, Congress the power to regulate commerce. And the general theme was as the nation developed, Congress should have the ability to set the rules for how commerce was developed across the country. The Supreme Court has twisted that in something called the dormant or negative commerce clause, which flips the other way at times and permit, prohibits the states from infringing on commerce. And it has been the commerce clause which has come into play in this context it is it that creates this physical presence rule that currently exists. The U.S. Supreme Court has said that under the Commerce Clause, a vendor must have physical presence, Amazon must have physical presence in order for it to be able, it to be obligated by a state to collect sales and use tax. The way the Constitution works is Congress may regulate commerce, which means Congress may step in and change the whole playing field. It may put in place rules that deal with this very topic of when states are able and eligible to collect, commerce, or collect sales and use tax. What the states have done to push the topic at this point is this concept of what's often called click-through nexus or Amazon nexus. And I think New York was probably the leader in this in trying to find a way of how do we get Amazon having physical presence in our state when we know they don't have a warehouse here, we know they don't have our own employees here, what they looked at was the fact that various Internet vendors with websites were physically located in New York. And if you were to go to some of those New York-based Internet vendors, you could click on icons on their website and get linked through to Amazon to actually implement your purchases. So you were clicking through from a New York-based website to take advantage of Amazon. And this is the concept of click-through nexus, where New York put in place laws that said, in very general way, but very much focused on Amazon, that if you are a retailer who is selling by means of an affiliated entity, and that's the word they used, was affiliate, meaning somebody with whom you have an agreement that if you were to go to that party's website and a purchaser were to click through from that website to Amazon, and actually buy something that you, the New York affiliate, could then get some fee of one cent or one percent of the transaction, that that would then be deemed by that state, New York is the first purveyor of this idea, 
to give you Amazon or whomever else happened to use the same technique with nexus or adequate connection with New York to obligate you, Amazon, to collect sales on any sales in New York to New York. Um, this got litigated, and in the end, the courts in New York so far have upheld it. Other states have begun to follow the trend, and it continues to have a trail of litigation, which, like many of these, is not having a consistent theme, although the trend is favoring the states at this point with this idea that click-through nexus is a way to tag Amazon or other remote vendors with adequate connection with the state to obligate them to collect sales and use tax. Um, what we've also seen happening in parallel with that is various senators being prompted by business interest within state, the brick and mortar mom and pop level business is saying, this is not fair. We can't compete with Amazon because of the sales tax differential, particularly in high tax states. We need federal legislation in place that will override this, as I said, can be done under the Commerce Clause. We need Congress to act and say, no, physical presence is not the standard anymore. It's something else. Um, hold that. We'll come to the federal legislation in just a second. The one other avenue some states have tried to go down is a reporting or notification approach. What well, we had Colorado. Who else have we had? I remember who else was on that list? Um, Colorado was the one that caught the main headlines, which was, we're not going to actually compel you, Amazon, or another vendor to collect sales and use tax. But they tried sort of a different tactic. If you have enough activity in this state, enough sales activity in our state, we're not going to press the whole nexus theme to the ultimate. But rather, what we want you to do is to report to us what transactions you've had in this state. Give us the list of the major transactions you've had. Uh, maybe some dollar amount will be involved. So that the states then could, to the extent they wanted to, chase the sellers, I'm sorry, the buyers in their states in terms of being able to go after the use tax side of it directly against the buyers in the state. Not as desirable an approach, but one that at least, again, has gotten Amazon and the other big Internet vendors' attention, again, gotten into litigation. In Colorado, I think it got stayed for a time while the courts are still trying to decide whether there's a constitutional issue or not. So that's been a different approach of a notification. Um, tell us who you're selling to in the state so we, the state, can go after them rather than obligating you with the big burden of doing the actual collection. Um, there have been several federal legislative provisions moving forward. It seems like activity is now centering around one of those. Mary, do you want to pick up on? Sure. It's the um, it's right. It's the Marketplace Fairness Act, and I think as of yesterday, it was passed by by Senate is as an amendment to the budget. And what these acts are intended to do is not to create a new internet sales tax because it's not allowed. It is to to force the state to collect a, a uh, sales tax on states that, on, on areas residents that doesn't have a physical presence. So it's kind of forced the collection of the use tax. There's always a minimum threshold for the marketplace. It's like a million dollars. But it does look like it's going to move forward. Um, I think that there is a com there's such a pressure from the brick and mortar buildings to say, hey, we're getting hurt by not having um, by having all these internet vendors out there. And I'm sure many of you like me, I've gone to a brick and mortar tried on whatever I wanted and then found it cheaper on the internet and um, and not have to pay the, the sales tax obligation on it. So I think this is just a way of trying to level out the playing field. There are a bunch of legislations out here. I'll flip through them pretty quickly, but they're in your handouts. Um, but this is the one that's been playing the, uh, the center role and seems to be getting the push forward. Yeah, that's the one. That, the Marketplace Fairness Act is the one to watch popping up in the headlines. and. It may be a while. I think what actually happened was there's a budget bill you may have heard of moving through Congress in both houses at this point. I think this just got tagged on as sort of a, an acknowledgement of we support it, but it wouldn't actually be passed if the bill got passed. I think it has to be separately passed unless something... I think happen. so. And it, it was interesting. It was also done by voice vote, so they didn't um, mark down. You know, there is no... So, so no one has that record to see who's for and against it because obviously it's a hot topic. 
Um, this whole idea that's buried in here, the streamlined sales and use tax agreement's been around for a while. And it's an agreement that is sort of pulled into this, where they've tried to get a number of the states to agree to make their laws more uniform so that there's only one administrator in a given state for the taxes, state and local, and the various exemptions become more uniform. It's only C3s that are exempt. It's not C3s and C4s. Or don't take me for what I said, but that is to get, get a uniform group of exemptions, get a uniform group of rules. And Maryland's one of the great examples of why this is such a challenge for this, sometimes the simplest and one might even say stupidest of reasons, although money is usually behind most things. Um, when most of us went to elementary school, we learned how to round. And usually when you round, you take, if you're at 5.4 cents, you would round down to 5. If you're at 5.6 cents, you would round up to 6. And that comes into being a very important mathematical formula in sales tax, in that if the sales tax due on a transaction is 5.4 cents, how much does the state get? Does it get five cents or six cents? Well, in most every state, if the transaction is 5.4 cents, they will collect five cents. If it's 5.6 cents, they will round up to five or to six cents. Maryland is, I don't know if it's entirely unique, but it has a round up all the time rule. So that if you're at 5.1 cents, that becomes six cents of sales tax due on the transaction. The uniformity approach has been to adopt the elementary school approach of while you're around up or down, depending on where you are on the scheme. For Maryland, the number that got put on it was if they had to switch from the round up rule to the round usual rule, they would lose about $25 million a year because of the change in the rounding rule. So Maryland has stayed away from any of the uniformity approaches at this point just because of the economics that the uniformity in the rounding rule would compel them to. And that's just one example of why states have shied away from uniformity. They have little catches in their own laws at this point, which they don't want to give up. The federal legislation is an example of why a state like Maryland is willing to be more acceptable. They have the, the understanding that if they could get the entitlement to collect from anybody to obligate vendors across the country to collect on their behalf for sales into Maryland, they'd get a lot more revenue coming in that they're now losing to Amazon, for example, that would largely make up the $25 million they would lose just under the rounding rule change. So this whole federal legislation approach makes it much more acceptable for the states to buy into the uniformity, which has long been talked about but not been accepted very well. So that sort of is the general theme of sales and use tax laws. We're going to touch quickly on uh, what nonprofits and other organizations often run into at the very start of what may become the audit process, which is something called a nexus questionnaire. And this is where states, when they have a sense that a business may be doing activity in their state, want to tap out and reach out and say, ABC nonprofit in DC, we see that in California you've been selling some goods and that you've got some of your personnel showing up here fairly regularly. We're sending you our Nexus questionnaire, and it'll arrive in the, you know, the chief financial officer or the tax manager's desk. It'll be a questionnaire with a letter from the state of California saying, please answer the 50 questions below and tell us how many days a year have you had employees in the state? Do you have an office in the state? Um, what other activity do you have in the state? How many sales do you have in the state? On and on, trying to document what degree of activity DC nonprofit has in California so that the California tax administrator can sit there and read the questionnaire and judge does DC nonprofit have enough activity in California that we can say you've got to collect sales and use tax on our behalf every time you sell to a person located in California. Um, and we've had a few horror stories over the years with, with Nexus questionnaires. The worst was one where the tax administrator just kind of kept chucking them in the drawer and it wasn't until that administrator moved on and the new person came in and found a drawer full of questionnaires and realized that the states had begun to more actively pursue aggressive threats against that particular organization because the questionnaires had not been responded to. Um, the theme there is take questionnaires very seriously. Um, 
they do need to respond to. If you don't respond to them, it is virtually always the case that at some point the state will come after you in much more increasingly levels of aggression to query why you're not collecting sales tax. And if need be, if you just never respond, they're eventually probably just going to send out an assessment uh, saying you do owe some money for lack of having responded at all. Um, as professionals, we are all the people who can help guide how they respond to those questionnaires because it does take care in making sure you don't inadvertently fill them in too unfavorably your own situation by just flippantly saying, well, we know we've sent a batch of people there for conferences. We'll just say, well, it's 30 times a year. When it happens to be that in state X, 25 is the magic number of days you can have somebody in the state before they deem it to be nexus. And so you really should have counted more carefully and made sure whether it was 20 days or 30 days that you, in fact, had people in that state. So nexus questionnaires really are the first step in the audit process, but one that merits careful attention so that you really focus on whether you do or do not have nexus and whether you want to have nexus with a given state to have to head down the path of being obligated to collect sales and use tax. Just um, one aside, there's a, a parallel, parallel at the federal level uh, with respect to uh, federal tax exempt status. The IRS has increasingly in recent years started using their own version of a questionnaire called a compliance check questionnaire that, that uh, quite a number of nonprofit tax exempt organizations have received. Um, and it, too, is, is almost a potential precursor to, uh, to an examination, to an IRS audit. Um, if you receive a compliance check questionnaire, uh, whether it's focused on overall exempt status compliance or whether it's focused on specific issues such as unrelated business income or executive compensation, um, or, or other issues, uh, it's very important that you take great care and work with uh, experienced uh, tax counsel to help you uh, fill that out. It, it, how you complete and respond to that questionnaire can have a very big impact on whether you get examined uh, by the IRS, and it's something that the IRS is doing with much more frequency because they realize they just can't audit every organization, um, but they can reach a lot more organizations through compliance check questionnaires. They can figure out who are better candidates for examination so that when they do go in to examine, they're more likely to find uh, troublesome issues and problems uh, and potential uh, uh, tax liabilities in the end. So uh, take great care if you do receive one of those questionnaires. Well, if you've been reading through everything I just said, you've probably been getting the bad message that the days of Amazon sales tax-free purchases may be slowly coming to an end. But uh, for the time being, it's still with us until Congress acts. Um, our last topic, I'll turn generally to Tamara to jump into, and that's um, conferences. And, and before I jump in, I know we have just a few minutes left. Here. Oh, oh sorry. sorry. Um, I know we just have a few minutes left. I didn't know if there were any questions. I was just going to pause here, ask for questions, and I can briefly go through the conferences, but um, any questions that anybody has? Okay, I will we'll go through. Um, we've worked with Jeff um, uh, with a fair number of clients, and Walter and I have worked with on conference hosting, and um, it's running the same theme. It's when a nonprofit has a conference in a different state. They hold their annual meeting. What kind of Taxes are they um, are they subject to, and and it's the same story here as you've heard all day. Is there's no general answer above all states. Some states will, you know, if you sell your books and um, T-shirts, some states will subject to a sales tax. Some won't. What we've also found is some states will have a hidden tax, like an admission tax. Um, which you won't see in their sales and use tax statute, but they will put that tax on a sort of ticket to go in, and there are ways to maneuver it so you aren't subject to the tax, but it, you know it, it differs from state. And then what we've also found is when we're doing the conference hosting, so we've talked a lot about the state tax level, but it gets even worse when you get to the county and local tax level because the guidelines are even more sparse. Um, it's not so easy to get an answer, um, and, and usually it's more complicated. However, what we have found is the individuals at the local, at the state revenue office, are incredibly helpful, and they really want to get this right. Most of these states want to encourage people to have conferences there. It brings money, it brings revenue to the state, um, so they've been extremely helpful. But it is rather, rather tricky, and something that you have to look into not only for the conference but what is the lingering effects of you having a presence in that state for a conference? Is it now going to subject all your sales 
you know, even after the conference um, to sales tax. And so it is a, an issue that should not be taken lightly, um, but, but an important issue to, to discuss. Of course, it can also factor into your decision as to where to hold a conference. So this is something that, uh, for those of you who are uh, in-house at, at nonprofits or advising uh, you know, the finance staff at nonprofits, uh, you know, be sure that, that, that the finance staff is working closely with the meeting staff at nonprofit organizations. Uh, you know, obviously, it's the, the meeting staff who are, are, are going to be involved in decisions such as uh, where to hold a conference, um, but it's really the finance folks who are going to be able to weigh in on this issue and really should give this, as, as Tamara said, consideration up front. Yeah, for those of you for whom the phraseology here didn't quite have meaning, I, I will elaborate on it. Senator Long was one of the uh, longtime federal legislators in the tax area, and he had a quote many years back, I think it was in the 60s, of don't tax you, don't tax me, tax the fellow behind the tree, which in this context alludes to the fact that if you've ever been to a place like Florida, you know they will load up on the taxes on those people who are not the voters in the state, the rental car taxes, the hotel taxes, the convention center taxes that apply for anything that happens at the convention center, so that they will very heavily in most states burden the vacationers, the conference attendees in the states, and people who don't vote in the state and aren't uh, having to pay the taxes. Um, one final aside that Tamara mentioned there was the, the, the long-term consequences of having had a conference and just being blatant on how that can loop back to the nexus topic of do you for income or sales tax have connection with the state a number of states will have some sort of day count rule, as I alluded to earlier, if you have your employees in the state for some number of days acting on your behalf, that may be adequate connection with the state to trigger tax obligations. And many states will take the position that attendance at conferences in the state, particularly if it's a trade show type activity where there's actual promotion of your organization going on in a way you may have a booth that's either selling your organization or actually selling some of your goods, that that may be a, a nexus factor that when you read a questionnaire, how many days did you have people at a trade show or conference in the state becomes a factor that can haunt you in the long run just by reason of your involvement with conferences. Um, so I think that wraps us up in terms of our coverage. Um, Walter and Tamara, a few questions uh, just to help uh, illuminate some of these issues. Um, in, in terms of what, what can trigger a nexus, you talked about having, having an office in a state clearly being something that would, without question, trigger, trigger a nexus. One thing we've seen a lot with, with our nonprofit clients is uh, telecommuting, and uh, a, a lot of nonprofits uh, have employees, frankly, throughout the country sometimes who work from their homes uh, on behalf of the nonprofit organization. Um, in, in your experience, to, to, uh, for states who've looked at that, or even just in how you counsel uh, our clients in this, would, would generally having uh, an employee who telecommutes from home in a state be enough to trigger a nexus in that state? Unfortunately, it's at the absolute, I think, and Tamara, you can jump in, but I think it's a fairly simple yes, that one of the bright, bright lines of physical presence is having an employee in a state tends to, by definition in most states, be adequate to have nexus with that state for income and sales tax, crossing even the more bold, tighter sales tax threshold. And for the most part, to the extent you don't hear states chasing it, it's merely because those employees are often more under the radar screen and more difficult to find than when you've got your name on an actual office with an address to it. Um, well, I think what's also an important point to remember is even if the telecommuter employee in the state is not involved in any of the sales, you know, aspects of the state, it, it doesn't matter. You know, or if their program is on X and here's your Y program, it's, that presence will carry for the entire um, organization, regardless of what the, the, employee, the employee's duties are. And just to push your, a little more into the gray, I mean, you use the word employee, often it's, you know, the next step in the gray is your independent contractor. You retain the independent contractor who's going to get a, a 1099 instead of a W-2, but is going to sit in their home office and do the work for you. Again, most states, if they become aware of that, if they want to come after you, can use that as a basis for next year. Yeah, and that was a, actually another question I was going to ask. Is a lot of uh, nonprofits will have independent contractors who do ad sales and things like that for their for journals and magazines and whatnot. 
not working exclusively for the nonprofit, but for others as well, and often working from their own home offices, and, and, and clearly that, that could trigger it. A lot of nonprofits also have employees, independent contractors, going around the country to different states for purposes of um, you know, uh, selling products or maybe selling ads, selling exhibits, uh, maybe uh, lobbying purposes, uh, you know, various other purposes. Uh, if you're spending enough time in a given state, presumably that could be enough to trigger a nexus too, even if no one's really physically located there on a permanent basis. Again, clearly a yes in a general way. You know, you get into the what are the practices of a particular state where it gets hard to answer that. Some states are going to have a clear, bright line of do you have employees or agents or representatives in our state for more than seven days, more than 20 days. They'll give you some bright line test. Others, it's much more of a judgment call of trying to guess what the state would do, trying to call them and ask them what they would do. They don't have a particular law on it, but at the constitutional level, you know, the big nexus level, generally it's going to be a state could use that take the position you are obligated to collect the tax if the state wanted to. Okay, two, two more questions for you, um, kind of uh, uh, unrelated questions. Uh, first off, we, we didn't really talk about today, um, uh, and, and this really maybe let's go back to the other side of selling products or services. So a nonprofit, uh, many nonprofits sell products or services. Um, and, and like you said, generally speaking, there is no exemption just because you're a nonprofit tax exempt organization. In most cases, there's no exemption from the obligation to collect and remit sales tax to a state when you're selling a product or service. And, and, that, and that applies um, whether you are selling something in person, like you set up shop at a conference and you're selling books and things like that, or whether you're selling, uh, you know, online, through the phone, through the mail, uh, et cetera, the same obligations exist. But talk for a minute about, you know, what sorts of, um, uh, 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 elaborate a little bit on products versus services and what types of things are generally subject to sales tax versus what's not. And I know it's a, it's a loaded question because it's very state by state. The definitions are very specific. Um, there's not a lot of uniformity here, but can you try to generalize for folks just so they have an idea? Generally speaking, what sorts of things, common examples, might be subject to sales tax typically and what might not on the collection side? Yeah, um, I mean, there are some pretty strong generalities one can draw there. Sales tax has virtually historically been limited to tangible personal property, you know, books and things you could touch and pick up. Has not historically picked up services has typically had, I guess, two broad categories of exempt products, uh, food and health care, sort of the two general ones you'll see a degree of uniformity on. If you're selling health care products or food products, those will often be exempted. But for the nonprofit world, I think we're largely dealing with here, probably most anything that's tangible personality would be taxable. Um, services have been sort of the target area of the states over recent times of trying to expand the list of services that are taxable. So you do see in many of the states a growing list of services that are taxable. It often is areas where there's not a strong lobbying interest to prevent or, or <laughs> fight off the tax. Uh, one that we've seen locally here is uh, lawn, landscaping, lawn care type services don't have much of a strong lobby. So they've typically gotten subjected to tax in many jurisdictions, just one simple example. In terms of the typical types of, and, and nonprofits tend to provide more services, some more services than they do products. Um, you know, books and things like that are very common, but, but beyond that, uh, I would say in general, nonprofits tend to sell more services. Um, are there any, uh, just based on your, your experience, any typical types of services that nonprofits might sell, uh, consulting services, um, any kind of analytical services, uh, educational services. Um, are things like that generally still going to be exempt in most states? General, Tamara, can you think of anything? I mean, the D.C.'s got sort of the information services. It's hard to sometimes figure out what is, but in general... You, you mean information technology services, yeah. IT-related? And, and that is something that some nonprofits do, do get into at some time. No, I agree. A lot of the services are sort of the long care where you need to go to that state to do it, or computer repair, where, the, where that's your service. You're not selling something, but you're going into the state to repair the services, not the, the thinking that you're, that you're describing, where there's nothing tangible associated with those services. Jeff, you're pushing us into two very difficult topics. One is services, because 
you open a whole can of worms as to where the services are being provided and who gets taxed. Um, you know, if somebody sits in their office in D.C., but the service sort of gets the benefit someplace else, that's a whole other topic of taxation. The other one is digital services. It's been a real hot topic of if, if I don't sell you this, if I send this to you in electronic format instead of sending you the actual pieces of paper, the states have begun to try to pursue the digital topic of is digital delivery in some way a tangible thing, although historically we've not thought of it that way. Again, as states chase revenues, they've made highly esoteric arguments about how electronic transmission involves some tangible element so that if I send this to you as a PDF, maybe in some states they take the position it's taxable. That's a whole other evolving world of intellectual property type taxation. And, and it's one that's very relevant to nonprofits who, who maybe in, in years ago used to sell their newsletters and their books and their journals and newsletters uh, in, in paper form. Yes. Uh, you know, a lot of times these things will be provided, for instance, to members uh, or donors free of charge, but then, you know, they'll sell subscriptions uh, to others. Um, these days, most nonprofits, except for perhaps their monthly magazine or journal, most of that is electronic. Um, and, and so that definitely can factor into that analysis. I mean, the general theme is digital or electronic delivery is not taxable today, but again, you do see states beginning to press that topic as they lose the revenue from the old forms of delivery. Right. Okay, any final questions for uh, Walter to Tamara? Yeah, right there. Now the question was whether D.C. has made any recent changes to their sales and use tax law. There's nothing coming right to my mind that's caught my attention. I don't want to say there's nothing because there's virtually always, if you look at any given legislature in any given year, there's virtually always a wealth of legislation, most of which never goes anywhere. Um, I try to follow in particular Maryland every year, and there's always delegates just throwing in their favorite organization, be it a veterans organization, be it a local charity, trying to get an exemption in for them. Most of those never go anywhere, but um, I'm not aware of anything at the moment on D.C. But Yep. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Walter, Tamara, thank you for a great presentation, and uh, thank you to the Greater Washington Society of CPAs for having us here today. Thank you.